Let's begin. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, today we are going to look at two of the most popular No Time to Train workshops. And it actually won't be a walkthrough. It'll be more like a brisk jog through. The reason is uh, we only have 30 minutes, and each of these workshops uh, is pretty malleable. Uh, the book says 10-minute workshops because that was our goal um, when we wrote this before the USDA standards came out. Now they're in 15-minute increments, which is totally doable. And both of these can be stretched to a half hour or beyond if you want to do all of the follow-up recommendations, discussion questions, all of the uh, food items, Example practice exercises. You can really spend a good amount of time with this uh, if that is your goal with your food service staff audience. So if you wanted to take 45 minutes or even an hour uh, with each of these, you could if you wanted to make up your own examples, pick your own target foods, really get into the discussion. Um, that is all fine. So I'm going to be touching on all of the examples, but because we're not in small groups and the platform unfortunately doesn't allow a lot of conversation between participants. I'm going to ask you to work on it individually and share your answers in the chat box when prompted. And I'll say choose one item or choose two items, whereas in real life we'd say, okay, small groups, you're going to have this set of five or set of ten, uh, and I'm going to give you, you know, three to five minutes to work on it. So it'll be a jog through because we're going to touch on everything and get you acquainted with the, the format and how this could be really helpful to you and to the schools you want to serve. If you're going to share this later, it will be recorded, which is great. So if you were going to share it with a number of other trainers, for example, feel free to hit pause at any point and use all of the examples. I'll tell you in just a slide or two um, how to find all of the examples if you don't have it in front of you right now. Okay? So buckle in. Let's go. Okay, the No Time to Train program is for uh, training school food service, SFS staff, uh, in the Smarter Luncheons program. It does satisfy the USDA professional standards learning outcomes. We'll talked about that in a moment. You can use it in 15-minute blocks. Uh, so remember to record it in 15-minute segments uh, on your tracking sheet when you use it. They're standardized, but they're very customizable. So you can use them straight up from the book, or you can add your own examples, extend the time you spend on different activities. That is all up to you and your audience. That's great. You can find these, if you don't already have a copy, on smarterlunchrooms.org under the Resources tab. You can find the No Time to Train trainer script. That's the book that you see here on the slide. There's also some slide presentations that go with some of the lessons. There is an appendix, which is the, really the back of the book, that has all the worksheets. And there is the professional standard supplement. That is the follow-up document that we put up after the USDA standards came out that aligns each of the activities in No Time to Train with those learning codes. Okay, so you'll need those for your tracking. You can also get more information from the community of practice. We've done a number of webinars on these resources. If you want to hear more, there's Intro to No Time to Train, Intro to the No Time to Train Professional Standards Supplement. Uh, there's webinars on Smarter Luncheon's principles and research, uh, especially there's a great one on suggestive selling and enhancing taste expectations given by Dr. David Just, which is really great, really entertaining and informative, which I'll refer to as I go through this. And there's uh, two on the Smarter Lunchroom scorecard, both how to use it and how to put it into a site visit. So I encourage you to look at those if you need follow-up information. Within No Time to Train, really quick overview there, each month has a main lesson and a follow-up lesson. They all have their objectives written out. The booster shot that comes afterward is really hands-on, and it's they coordinate with the professional standard supplement for those codes. Today's featured workshops are going to be Give Foods Catchy Names and Positive Communication Cues. Give Foods Catchy Names really goes with enhancing taste expectations. That goes with the uh, web great webinar by Dr. David Just. And then Positive Communications goes with suggestive selling. You can see the learning codes. I got those right out of our professional standard supplement. And they each go with scorecard items. There's plenty of scorecard items that to highlight giving foods catchy names, posting those in a prominent location, using them on menus, and their scorecard items on rapport with the students and using these gentle and encouraging cues as opposed to trying to be coercive by saying they have to take something. So these line up with a lot of the professional standards that we need to incorporate uh, in our best practices. Okay, let's get started. Give foods catchy names. All right, quick intro. 
Uh, this will be on page 28 of your book. We begin by explaining to the staff that foods taste largely how we expect them to taste. There's a, a highlight of a Food and Brand Labs experiment on wine. When people were told that wine was from California, they enjoyed their meal more, tipped more. Same night in the same restaurant, same test restaurant, the diners were told that, uh, the, on the other side of the room, were told that their wine was from North Dakota, and they responded by saying, no, they didn't like their meal, they didn't tip well, and sure enough, I always ask the audience here, what was the twist? Well, the twist, of course, was that both wines were the same wine. They're both from Virginia, two buck chuck from Virginia, and it was their perception of the wine that determined not only how much they liked the wine, but how much they liked everything else associated with it. There was a halo effect in terms of their enjoyment of the meal, whether they tipped well, whether they appreciated the service, and whether they decided to make return reservations. So this is a great little conversation starter with your group saying how the presentation of something, how we think about it, how we hear about it, really informs how we experience it. So that's a nice little talk. And to prove this, I ask everyone to do the first interactive activity. So I ask them to look at these two lists of colors. Imagine you're buying lipstick for yourself or a partner, and which of these lists of lipstick colors sounds more appealing? Light pink, dark pink, red, and peach? Or sun-kissed strawberry, luscious raspberry, Friday night scarlet, or perfect summer peach? I'd take a poll in a group, but since you're alone, I'm going to say let's have a physical activity break. So roll your left wrist if you like the left list and roll your right wrist if you like the right wrist. Everyone commit. I can't see you, but let's play along. I want to imagine that a lot of you picked the right side. Okay, let's try it again. How about with cars? You're shopping for a car. Do you like a sign that says, buy your minivan, sports car, truck, or SUV here? Or do you like one that highlights a grand caravan, a Mustang, a Silverado, or an Expedition? Which of those is a more enticing list of car descriptions? Left side roll or right side roll? I'm going to imagine there's a lot of right wrists rolling now, right? Because those are more interesting. We'll talk about why in just a second. For our last example, how about this? You're going out for lunch or dinner. Do you like a menu that lists, we have steak, coleslaw, salad, and grilled cheese today? Or do you want to order the sizzling T-bone steak, the tangy coleslaw, the crisp garden salad, or the crunchy toasted cheddar sandwich? Go ahead. Which one makes your mouth water, left side or right side? And I would imagine, once again, the right sides win. Well, why is that? Why are the right sides from this list, this list, and this list so much more appealing when they're the same product. Well, let's talk about why. The reason is these evocative and descriptive imaginative names appeal to us because it references other things that we like, um, such as Friday night or summer, perfect day, uh, or it gives us descriptions that make, literally make our mouth water, things like crunchy, toasted, crisp, tangy, sizzling. Those details are, are evocative. They appeal to different senses. They appeal to our memories, and that's what makes food more appealing and items more appealing. It's why there's lots of money in marketing. And so when we're marketing food in our lunchroom to our audience, we want to make sure that we appeal to them as well. And we can sell a lot more product. We can move a lot more reimbursable meals. We can make sure that the kids are getting uh, and accepting the nutritious food that the standards have offered us by making sure they seem appealing to the kids. And we, we're going to try that with catchy food names. I could go into it more, but we're on a time schedule. Uh, so if you want to learn more about this, reference David Just. He talks about all the science behind what we do. It's also in Module 1 of our complete training program if you're a TAP. So um, email me if you need more information about that. We have a webinar on the complete training program as well. All right, moving on. This is the fun part. Now we're going to give it a try. We're going to give foods catchy names. Something to think about. We're going to start with K through 5 because those children are really fun. They like imaginative, playful names. Uh, examples that we've proven in the field are really appealing are X-ray carrots. 
because they make your eyes, side carrots are good for eyes, right? Big bad bean burrito. We like the alliteration. We like it sounds tough and fun. And even really imaginative names like dinosaur trees for broccoli. Kids like dinosaurs. That's kind of fun. They like to, they like to play with their food. So we're going to use that playfulness and ask you to, right here on the spot, come up with one catchy food name. So I want you to look up um, on the screen. On the right side, we have our basic non-descriptive, our basic menu item. We're trying to move green beans. We're trying to move our baked sweet potatoes. We're trying to move peas, baked apples, black bean soup, or veggie pizza. Pick one of those items, and then look at the word bank. We have American, Fiesta, Jumpin', Green Lantern, Power, Rainbow, Sweet Talkin', Black Belt, and Snappy. Pick one item, pick, and then pick a word from the word bank that you think makes a attractive menu item, okay? Remember that the first time kids interact with a lot of your foods will be on their menu that goes home. So there might not be space for a picture. There might not be space for or budget for colored ink unless you're doing it online and, and, and can use colored graphics and so forth. So if they just have the words, those other things are great too. We can talk about that in the booster shot. But if you're just looking at words and you don't have a lot of space, you just have room for one or two words, what would you pick? The poll is open. Why don't you go give it a try? I'll wait a couple seconds, say 10, 20 seconds for everyone to complete it. Go ahead. Yep, it's working. It's collecting the responses right now. All right. Let me read them to you. All right. Go for it. Jumping green beans. Green lantern green beans. Power veggie pizza. Green lantern green beans. Power peas. Rainbow veggie pizza. Snappy green beans, sweet talking baked sweet potatoes, fiesta black bean soup, two more snappy green beans, uh, sweet talking baked sweet potatoes, green lantern green beans, lots of green beans, um, power veggie pizza, rainbow veggie pizza, uh, snappy green beans. I think that that green, yeah, that covers most of them. Um, a lot oh. of repeat ones in there. <laughs> Perfect. No, that's great. And uh, for those of you who are who are watching or watching this either live or later, this will be recorded and you can go back. Feel free to use all of these. We are a sharing economy here. So all of those are great. You said they all sound much more interesting than just either green beans or what I've seen a lot, vegetable. I've seen just vegetable or fruit on menus. So this is, adds, you know, interest. It's not just a default. It's something cool. It's fun. It's it, um, jump in or power or Green Lantern it sounds exciting. It sounds like it gives you energy. It sounds like a superhero, which kids love. Fiesta Black Bean Soup, right, that has, that implies flavor. It implies fun. It implies a party. Rainbow Veggie Pizza sounds like a lot of really, you know, beautiful, colorful veggies. Or um, I heard there was another one that was Veggie Pizza, which I, which I like too, but I forget right now. I'm sorry. Um, snappy Green Peas sounds like they're not overcooked to death. Okay, so um, all of those are really exciting, and they will be really appealing. Okay, so we reviewed them. Here's some nice pictures that go along with it, but the, the, the names themselves are fantastic. Okay, let's try it again. Let's try it with some older kids. Uh, older kids, grades 6 to 12, enjoy evocative, descriptive names. I see our time. We don't have time to, to go through them, so share this slide with your people afterwards. They might like things like Texas, VIT, Homestyle, Harvest, and so forth. Okay, I'm going to skip past that. The, the last part of the workshop is the same idea. We're going to try it right here. Creative design, this is where we give other example foods, and this is where you can switch in the target foods from your own lunchroom. So I said corn, kale, kiwi, squash, and a salad bar, and a couple of entrees. So at home, right now, we're opening up the new poll. Go ahead and pick one of the items that I've listed, and then pick one of those age groups. Do you want to stick with K through 5, something imaginative and playful, or do you want to go for a more mature audience, 6 to 12, and something evocative, descriptive? Think juicy, think flavor, think texture, think sophisticated. Go ahead and give it a try. We're going to try this poll again. Um, so let's see, some popular, the most popular this time, well, people are interested in 6 to 12 age group. Um, we've got actually a lot of different answers. Um, slam dunk squash, sassy salad bar, curly kale, succulent baked chicken, K5 crazy corn, gobble gobble turkey sub, VIP turkey sub, fly away baked chicken, 
Super Power Kale, 612 Fresh Turkey Sub with Sweet Corn, Crispy Kale, Rockin' Sockin' Corn, Star Spangled Squash, Turkey Trot and uh, Sub Sandwich, Honey Roasted Baked Chicken, Rockstar Salad Bar, oh, I, I like that one, uh, Juicy Baked Chicken, Sunburst Stuffed Squash, Kickin' Kiwi. Those are fantastic. And you guys came out with them literally on the fly. So this is a great activity, especially if you give a little more time with large groups, break them into small groups, get them to talk with each other. You get a really good vibe. Uh, this is a great one to, to start with. I've always had success with it. And people have fun. And then afterwards, I ask people to, okay, let's vote on our top three. We're definitely going to use three of these. Which ones do you want? And saying that really helps the staff know that they are being listened to, that their ideas are important and they're incorporated, and they like it. There's a great follow-up booster shot that actually uses these to make labels for the food. You can even go further and put add clip art or photos to go with it and, and hang them on a today's special and tomorrow's special kind of menu board and really make this part of your routine. You know, really pick your target items and, and hype them up. I love when they rhyme, like Rockstar Salad Bar, that was really cool. Uh, Rock and Sockin' is really cool. If, if you um, are excited about a seasonal thing, I heard Turkey Trot, Turkey Sub, you know, you can move that into your seasonal decor and making it make it kind of special that way too. So, uh, and you can also take the same items and rename them multiple times during the year if you want to give them, that, again, that fresh kind of faith and curiosity on the kids' part. And this is a great thing to incorporate other stakeholders in. Because it is fun, because it is not threatening, it's a great way to incorporate students or a parent PTA group or invite that that administrator, to, uh, school administrator to come in and, and, and follow along. It's a, it's a great way to make them feel like they're making an impact too. And if they're interested, they're more likely to commit other resources, whether financial or time or just buy-in. Um, so it's a great entry level kind of activity. Okay? So thanks for reviewing those with us. Feel free to refer back. And then last bit, add suggested selling, add visibility to your suggested selling. We have some example labels for both the elementary and the middle and high school levels that look like this. It's all names that we came up with in groups. You're welcome to use ours and of course make your own. So feel free to share those with anyone who might be interested, okay? They're also located in the complete training program module one. But if you have trouble finding it, again, just reach out to us. The Ben Center email is at the end of this program or you can write to me Specifically, Erin Sharp in her prime at gmail.com, and I will help you too. We're going to move right along to positive communication cues. This asks people first to think about a little serious subject. Rapport between, a positive rapport between school food service staff and students is really essential for creating that safe, inviting space for kids to, to really make their own and feel comfortable and, and eat. And yet, Everyone can name a situation, either hypothetical or from experience, either their own experience or someone else's experience, where con some kind of conflict has arisen. So real quick, uh, our third poll today is, can you name a situation when an interaction between a lunchroom staff member and a student or school staff member led to anger, frustration, or hurt on either side? What happened? Uh, in just, at most, two sentences, but even as little as just a couple key words. If you have an answer for this, enter it in the poll, and we'll see what kind of things lead to conflict in the lunchroom. While y'all are working, I will say this is a good chance to kind of level with the staff, because a lot of times you will find some grievances come up. There's definitely a, a place to, to let that out and kind of write it on it write it on the board and start the discussion, but don't linger on this because you don't want it to become a very long extended break session. Usually you'll have three at most five answers and that's a good place to start to ground the discussion, but then we're going to move on from it. So confront and then move forward with a with the workshop which is a solution to these things. Okay, Katie, do you have any any responses to share? Yes. First one Imposed silent lunch because of poor acoustics and kids talking. Student expressed dislike for an item. Grouchy cashier moving people along in not a nice way. Students weren't taking fruit or veggies, so cafe put up a, a sign, you must take. Um, no funds in account or meal denied. Um, disrespectful students having students return to the earlier in the line to pick up missed items and okay. wanting more I think portions. Okay, and we're wanting more portions. Um, so 
a lot of these have similar roots. There's a disconnect between what, you know, the, um, the service staff offering something or needing the kid to take it and the kid wanting to take it. There's the lack of power or the difference in power with kids feeling forced to do something or not being allowed to do something, not being allowed to talk with their friend, not being allowed to eat what they want, not being allowed to go back and get extras. This power differential is you know, one of the reasons that, that some conflict can occur. And it also can be a lot of outside things. We could get into this more, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead. So please download the whole book and look up the more detailed responses and discussion prompts in there. I don't want to keep people too late. Having reviewed those responses, you can kind of pull out, okay, I see in this particular group, you know, this one school that I'm teaching or this one group of a county why school food service staff meeting that I'm leading, I see what's, uh, I'm going to try to pull together some of the main conflicts, kind of distill it down to what I think are the most popular ones, because you might not be able to deal with every single issue, but you can pick the core two or three. And a lot of times it falls into something like this. We said a lot of these already. Negative comments, students wanting something or not wanting something, and sometimes we see examples of school service staff not assisting somebody, especially the, the kindergarten level or with uh, early language learners or kids that can't read well at this point for whatever reason. Um, there can be some, some conflict between the school staff uh, wanting to go on their only break of the day and then the lunchroom staff needing those staff to help the students. And anyway, we've seen, we've seen it all. What you're going to do then is leave them with a few bits of wisdom. First is that nobody wins an argument with a student. I throw this out to the group and ask them what that means. And the answer, my answer is that a student you know, uh, you don't win an argument with a student because if they feel shot down or not listened to, even if the staff member feels, ha ha, I won that one, the kid can always get the last word, either by not buying lunch or telling all their friends and they don't buy lunch or just, it's not a fixed situation. So we need to find a way not to win the argument but to fix the situation, to fix that interaction. Um, we're going to use positive messages as opposed to trying to trump or bully a kid into doing what we want or need them to do. I also ask, what else could be going on? Kids, you know, they're bringing baggage from all over the place. What could be going on that could lead them to lash out in, in, or act in a negative way? People in the lunch room are often on the, the, the bad side of a power differential. And they're usually working there. It's usually not for the big bucks. It's usually because they like kids. We say, what else could be going on? And this is the part where it's like the opposite of the first question. The first question asks them or lets them air their grievances. This one says, what could be going on there beyond the scenes? And that's when they realize kids do have problems at home, at school, with peers. Or I said, a potpourri of awkward, disappointing, or embarrassing life events that seem to characterize the school years. This is when they get back on the kid's side. I encourage you to read this part of the the lesson because it is a great motivator for them to turn around and say, okay, I'm going to make the bridge. I'm going to be the one. I'm the adult. We control the situation. We can afford to be generous. We can afford to be smiling and patient and caring because that might be the first bit of kindness that the kid experiences. Uh, and, and this empowers the school food service staff to not feel like they are the punching bag for other people's baggage. They are instead the safe haven and the harbor for these kids who need to come in a lot of times, especially if they're on assisted or free reduced meal service, you know, this is their safe place where they can get, uh, they can be fed, they can be taken care of, and we want to make sure that they do not view this as another negative thing in their life. This is a, a safe place, and this is really the part that, in my experience, is touches the school food service staff. Uh, many of them may have experienced need as children or as, as parents of children, and now they say, okay, you know what, yeah, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to be a positive force. I'm going to try. I I love to use this quote by Aesop. So, okay, that's the first part. The second part, how do we do it? This is pretty easy. It's a, it's a worksheet. Be careful of literacy. You might want to um, extend this time-wise and read some of them out loud with the staff if you think there's a literacy barrier, or even go through and add your own with simpler language or uh, explain it in maybe even a second language if, if you have a lot of bilingual service staff members. But anyway, this worksheet, which is in the book, it's in the um, appendix at the end, uh, gives five different occasions, greeting, serving, point of sale, special request, and defusing conflict. And we ask them to pick any two of those. They're not going to read the whole worksheet. They're going to pick two of these situations that appeal to them. Everyone does greeting, and then they pick one of the last four as well. 
say we picked greeting and point of sale. All right, each of these has a goal. So they're going to read the goals for, uh, for greeting are creating a welcoming atmosphere, taking the first step, and promoting reimbursable meals or target items. And the goals for point of sale are specifically the reimbursable meals, making sure that they are filled out, and then uh, and prompting kids to, to do so. so. So they have goals on both sides. All right, each of those occasions is partnered with a set of goals and is partnered with five, approximately five exact cues. And so what they're going to do is pair up, look at each other's eyes, and deliver the cues that go with the occasions they picked. And not just going to read it, they're going to say it. They're going to say out loud, good morning, what would you like to try today? Smile. Hello, would you like to try? And you can, you can give them something to stick in there, veggie pizza, rainbow veggie pizza. Welcome to lunch. Rain, rainbow veggie pizza is popular today. Would you like to try it? Would you like to try some? What can I get for you? All right, with point of sale, I see you don't have all of your items. Why not grab a apple? All right, here it is. Here's the basket. You get two sides. You can still pick one. Go ahead and pick now. It's not too late. Your meal's not complete. Don't forget, you can make that a meal with fill in the blank. So actually saying these out loud gives the staff the words to use. It gives them options, and they're not caught flat-footed in line with kids, and the only thing they can say is, you have to take this, or that's not a meal. You have to take something. We want to get away from that language. I heard it earlier today, right? That's where some of that conflict comes from. Instead, this gives the service staff lines to use and share. And they say it to each other, and they say, that sounds good, or that sounds like something you'd say. And then they can cross off the ones they don't like. They only have to pick two from each list to use for later. And what they're going to do is they're going to mark, circle, or highlight their two favorite prompts per section. If you had time, you can have them write them on little cue cards. I like to bring index cards and have them copy those down. And then post them at the workstation, either the cue cards or even just sticking up the worksheet with the highlighted ones. The important thing is the choosing. The fact that they chose two of them off that list means that they feel empowered to use those, okay? Make sure to use daily, smile, and then there's some points for reinforcing and follow-up that I won't take time to talk over now. They are in the book, okay? But basically, it's positive reinforcement frequently, especially at first, okay? So you can look that up yourself. The next steps would be to get the book, either download it, or if you need 40 of them, they come in boxes of 40. You can email us at ben at cornell.edu and ask for a box of 40 uh, if you're going to use that many. If not, we ask you to just download them. And then you can print the whole thing off, or you can just print off the months you need. And if you need any extra help, you can email me, again, either at Ben or Erin Sharp in her prime at gmail.com. Okay? Make sure to check out our archived community of practice webinars, as well as uh, our resources on smarterluncheons.org under resources. Okay? Thanks so much. I know we went a couple minutes over, but we covered a lot. Okay, well, I will say thank you, everybody, for attending and for participating in the polls, and I hope you feel empowered to share this with your trainers and then with school food service staff, of course. So this is a great way to get buy-in, to collect stakeholders, to show them that the power that they have and the potential that they have in rejuvenating and even repurposing their lunchroom. It's not just a place where kids have to eat. This is a warm, inviting, healthy space, and they are the key to it. The staff is the key. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today, and I look forward, if you have follow-up questions, just email me or certainly take a look at all of our resources online because we're here to help you.